Hey lovely ladies, Shakti here and so happy to be here for the first of two live streams um, on love as we come towards Valentine's weekend, um, the focus on love. So um, super welcome everyone who watches this live or watches this back. This video is entitled Healing the Wounds of Love. And tomorrow's video is going to be Embodying Awakened Love. So welcome. Thank you for being here and joining me for this. Mm, so um, before I start the full sharing, um, just want to say a couple of things. Um, and I've got my computer here next to me open. So if I look to the side, uh, that's because... Uh, comments often don't come up on my phone so I've got my um, computer to the right of me so I can look for comments and answer any comments or questions that you have as I go through things um, and also I've got a few notes here but usually I tend to just go with the flow when I'm talking great so <clears throat> for those of you who don't know um, I am a priestess of love and sacred sexuality. I initiated through the Mary Magdalene Mystery School based in Glastonbury, at the Glastonbury Goddess Temple. But really, <laughs> my almost the, almost the last 20 years of my life have been devoted to what I would describe as the quest for love. And this is born out of my own wounding um, and my own search for healing and integration. Um, so, of course, we all are born with the perfect life story, the perfect situation to catalyze us to become who we're here to be. And for me, my life path and the context into which I was born very much created me as the one who became who I am now uh, with this absolute devotion and passion and focus to learning, teaching, embodying, studying, living true love, divine love, authentic love in concert with sacred sexuality. So for me, the two go completely together. They are not separate. And... And so for me, the path has been very much about embodiment. I began as a teacher of ecstatic and conscious dance. That was my first step onto this pathway. But then that's been um, complemented by many further trainings and experiences in yoga, meditation, tantra, counseling, energy healing, body work, all of these things. So... Healing the Wounds of Love. Um, this is a huge theme um, that really speaks to my own heart because I could, I could kind of say that um, much of my own life has been devoted to that. So in a way, I'm an expert. Well, not in a way, I am an expert of healing the wounds because that has been my own personal journey. Because of my own wounding, I've sought out unconsciously situations where those wounds have repeatedly gotten touched and triggered. And so I've suffered a lot. And at first it was all very unconscious for a long time until the pain and the suffering and the repetition of those cycles of pain was um, so acute. And I realised <laughs> the common denominator was me and began to look for answers and solutions. And that isn't to say that overnight my life changed and overnight everything was easy. That's not the case at all, but my experience has given me great insight and great sensitivity to this theme in myself, you know, because I never, teach something that I have not lived and experienced. I do a lot of studying um, but and practice, but it's really about the lived experience where this depth of wisdom comes from. But I can really see 
those patterns so clearly in others also having made this such a big part well did I make it it almost feels like it wasn't a choice really such a big part of my life and it is my ongoing devotion to embody love and truth and sacred union so before I go on to more sharing, I also want to invite you to share um, the prayer that I say every morning as a priestess of Rhiannon, um, goddess of love and sacred sexuality, um, because it's a beautiful opening for this. So here we go. And you can speak it to Rhiannon if she is resonant for you or just to the divine, to source, to whatever feels true for you. Beloved Rhiannon, Thank you for the love that is in and all around me. May my eyes see clearly. May my ears hear the truth beneath story. May my voice be healing in action. May my hands manifest all that is good. May my heart be the drumbeat of love in this world. May my dance be your energy in motion. May my feet hold boundaries, healthy and strong. And may my body open and surrender to your flow in the meeting with presence. Beloved Rhiannon, may my mind be filled with love so that my mind and thoughts create a world of love. And so it is. So that's our opening prayer. So on to the wounds of love. I've got some stuff, I've got some notes here that I want to share, but please, if questions come up for you or insights or something you want to share as I'm talking, please go ahead and post them and I'll do my best to respond as well. So the wounds of love. In a way, we are all born with an original wound of love which is the wound of separation. So we come and go from source. We in fact are source. We never really leave source as in God, divine, truth, divinity, love. But in coming from the all into this finite body, there is the experience of separation. And so actually, as a first point, all of us will have that experience of separating from where we come from and thinking that we're no longer that. The more we come into this finite being self, this unique personality self, this ego construct, this body, this life experience, the, the further we get away from the point of birth when we come from the light into the world, right? We begin to lose the knowing that we are love and these layers of forgetting are then placed upon us, conditioned through us so that we forget that we're source. If you look at a newborn baby and I've had the, the blessings to have two beautiful children and when they're born and when they're infants it's so clear that they have that direct connection still to God and that there is really no separation. There's such an innocence and a purity and a divinity in a newborn child and an infant. And then through the path of becoming self-aware, self-conscious, and then all of the programming of the world that is layered on top of that beautiful innocent being, each of us, the forgetting begins. You know, I remember when my children were very young, my daughter used to speak about her past lives. She spoke about the fact that um, she was the goddess Isis. She remembered things, she remembered being my mum in a former life, and then that began to disappear. So we all have that connection, and then it goes in the forgetting. And in a way, the spiritual journey is about the remembering while we're still alive in this lifetime that the love never went, we are the love, we are God, we are source. But so we can all individually feel that separation. And in a way, the quest for love that's driven me so 
much and probably drives many of you in various ways. First and foremost, you can understand it as this quest to reunite with your true self, your quest to reunite with God, with love, with source, which we direct into the external until we begin to realize that that which we are seeking, and I know this is a truism, but it is true because I've discovered this, it's not out there, it is, it's already here. We are that which we seek. And we forget and we remember and we forget and we remember, but really God, truth, love, source is right here. It can't be anywhere else. Okay, so that's the original wound. Um, but then, of course, on top of that original wound, which we will all feel to a greater or lesser extent, when we come into our families, when we are born, <clears throat> for most of us, probably 99.9% .9 of us, what we experienced in our formative years was a form of conditional love, not unconditional love, again, to varying degrees. And this is not to make anyone bad or wrong or to blame anyone whatsoever. This is just the state of the world as it is right now because most people are asleep. And so <clears throat> love that we experienced as children was conditional. So we learned very young, very early on, um, to feel safe, to feel secure, to feel worthy, to feel loved, we had to change and adapt who we really are. And as children, you have no choice over this. It's a survival instinct, which is why when your core wounds get triggered in a relationship and it feels like life or death, it is because the original wound, it was about survival. You had to adapt to stay safe, to feel loved, to feel worthy. So you were already bending yourself out of shape from a very young age to feel loved, not knowing that you already are loved and not understanding, of course, as a young child that <clears throat> your parents knew knew better, knew no better. They couldn't do any better than they did. They were doing the best they could with what they had. So, and of course, then there could be the... Um, different cultural behaviours or conditioned patterns of parenting in different generations and different societies. So for example, when I was a child, when I was a baby, the way of parenting was to leave the baby crying, leave it the baby in the pram outside to cry itself to sleep because that was the done thing. That was what parents were told to do. And um, otherwise you were spoiling the child, right? So that's how I was parented and of course as a mother who did the very opposite of that that idea horrifies me because I would pick up my children as soon as they cried I would feed them whenever they were hungry on demand feeding it's a very different way of parenting and I remember my parents saying to me you'll spoil her you'll spoil her if you do that if you pick her up every time she cries you'll spoil her she'll manipulate you as if a one-year-old or a six-month-old or a 18 month old has a manipul manipulative bone in their bodies you know it's just survival instinct right <laughs> um, but so that kind of parenting that's just one example of many set up for me uh, because I've gone into sort of regressions and ceremonies and rituals where I've accessed that howling baby who was hungry and wasn't being fed and that set up a wound in me which is needy which is hungry which is frightened that no one's gonna come right so it can be this deep and this unconscious <clears throat> but these are just ordinary behaviors these are just ordinary behaviors of course in some situations there are traumas abuse, psychological, physical, emotional, spiritual traumas and abuses that happened, which would potentially, but not necessarily, create an even deeper stigma or wounding. So that's the first part. 
the adaptation, the, the need to survive, and all those additional traumas that can happen. Now, what occurs when we're that young and defenseless and we are dependent on the caregivers to guide, lead, we think that's right. We know no different. That's our worldview is this is what love is. When my father beats me, that's love because he's my father. When my mother shouts at me, that's love because that's all I know, right? So we become conditioned and we we go out into the world thinking that this distorted conditional love is what love is. Not knowing that that is not love, but that's what we've been conditioned to believe. And it's so deep rooted that it can be very hard to shift the realization that that is not the truth, that is not the reality, that, that that is not love. And of course, it's in the body. So every part of work that I do, we go into the body because your memories, you know, typical counseling and psychology works with the mind. But from my perspective, if you're only working with the mind, you will never heal completely. You have to go into the body. The body is where these memories are stored subconsciously, cellularly, and to heal, which we're going to get onto in a minute, you have to go into the body because that's where the memories are. It's pre-verbal, it's pre-thinking, it's subconscious. Subconscious is the body. This can affect your posture, it can affect your breathing, it's going to affect your health, and uh, you won't even understand why. So then, um, of course, we go out into life, we have these conditionings, we have these wounds, we have these traumas, and we are naturally programmed in a way to seek resolution, to remember that we are God, to remember that we are whole, to remember that we are love. And so what happens is, and also of course those beliefs and that conditioning is, is are the thought forms that we are vibrating into the world. So of course we create the world as a mirror of our own mind, as a mirror of our own subconscious. So that is why when things keep happening to you and you're saying, but why? It's because that is a belief that you hold. That is a thought form that you hold. That is a frequency that is in your body. You're not aware of it until you become aware of it, but that is why you keep having experiences with people that are of a certain quality or a certain experience, it's because of that. You know, for example, my father has this belief that um, people are always out to get me. People are always out to swindle me. People are always out to make a fast buck. That's a belief that he holds. I don't hold that belief. It doesn't ring true for me whatsoever, but he holds that belief. So he has experiences that reinforce that belief for him. That's how it works. And it works the same in love and relationship. Whatever your beliefs are, that will be reflected back to you. So in a way, it's something to be grateful for because life is showing you what you believe. And then you have an opportunity to change and heal. <clears throat> the other thing is that we're naturally programmed, to, as I said, to seek resolution. So when we go into relationships, there will naturally be an attraction to the one who is going to be the exact perfect opposite mirror to your wounding to push all those buttons, not as a deliberate act to hurt you or be mean to you, but to wake you up to what those wounds are in yourself so you become whole. You can choose to see that and recognize it and know that you're 100% responsible for everything that happens in your life and that that person is there to gift you this seeing or you can be unconscious and blame them for what's happening and make them responsible for your experience which they never are they're there to show you what you need to see to become whole and return to love that is the purpose of relationship and every relationship it's a perfect fitting together like a key in a lock your wounds, their wounds, there we go. You can either choose to stay there and work it out, which is the potential, or blame, shame, get angry, or run away, right? That's what relationship is about. 
And of course then adult wounds may add on to the childhood wounds, either through the ongoing repetition of a pattern that was set up very, very early for you. And some of these things are so early, you, you wouldn't necessarily have a memory of them. Um, and then there can be sudden other additional experiences that are like out of the blue, you know, a sudden additional trauma, a sudden additional shock, a sudden additional experience. And the key ones would be betrayal, abandonment and rejection. Those are the key places where we get wounded, betrayal, rejection and abandonment. Um, that sort of compound. So I'm going to talk about a couple of um, common patterns that then are set up for us in the way that we relate. Having already said, it's always a key in a lock situation. It's giving you the opportunity to see how your key fits into their lock. So, for example, the one that I know very well from my own experience and conditioning is the codependent with the addict, the codependent with the abuser. <clears throat> right? The codependent is comes from a place of wounding where they were so needing to feel safe and loved that as a young person they bent themselves out of shape to win the approval, the validation, the love, in inverted commas, of course it wasn't love, the security of the caregiver. So then going into relationship, that same dynamic is repeated. You are inauthentic. Essentially, you override your own needs. You don't speak your truth. You let your boundaries be overridden because you're so scared to be left alone and rejected. And so the abuser or the addict, you support their behavior directly or indirectly by staying in that toxic dynamic, supporting their addiction, allowing their abuse. They're never gonna change so long as you remain codependent and in that relationship, never. You think you're gonna save them, you think your love is gonna heal them. It never will, that is you in your conditioning that if you just love enough, they will eventually realize how amazing you are and love you. It's never gonna happen. That's the codependent, the addict, the abuser. That's the dynamic. Similar, these are all similar and I've had experience of all of these, so I speak from experience. The empath and the abuser or the narcissist. The empath who feels everything so deeply, who just wants to love everyone and heal themselves and the world and the narcissist sucking up that energy of overgiving you know overgiving love overgiving healing overgiving over caretaking and the narcissist just takes 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 and the empath is sucked dry and loses themselves in the narcissist. They lose their sense of self completely. The narcissist is all about self. The empath loses his or herself in that energy of the narcissist. Similarly, people pleaser, overtaker, giving, overgiving and the taker. Same dynamic. And all of these dynamics are set up from the fact that you didn't feel worthy and loved as a child or as an infant. And so the only way that you knew to try and win security, validation, worthiness was by doing whatever you could to try and get that from your caretaker, caregiver, parent, mother, father, whatever you needed to do, you, you would do it because it was survival, right? And that is why when we get into these dynamics, um, it's why we stay even though there's abuse happening. It's why we stay even when we're overgiving and they're overtaking. Um, because that primal wound has been activated and we are terrified of losing what we believe to be our source of love, what we believe to be our source of validation, what we believe to be our source of security. It's not the that ancient old wounding tells us that it is, because that's what our child 
experienced. It's not true. All of that security, love, stability, validation starts and ends with you and is never about anyone else. Another couple of patterns I want to talk about. And if you recognize yourself in any of these, please share. Um, is just looking at my notes projection and illusion. So, again, I speak from experience of having done all of these as well as having studied all about this. It's where we fall for the potential in a person rather than the actual. So, they're telling us exactly what they want. They're showing us through their actions how they are, but there's a part of us which is saying, ah oh, yes, but I can see this person has the potential to be da, 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 da. So we, are, we have a fantasy, it's an illusion, it's not real. And we're projecting that illusion, that fantasy onto them. So we are seeing the potential rather than the actual. And if we're really honest with ourselves, they are showing us the actual, we're just denying it in order to feel the satisfaction of putting our fantasy of love onto them. When we put our fantasy of love onto them, they feel that and it's really uncomfortable and that's going to be repellent. I don't want to take on your fantasy of who you think I am. And we all have these fantasies, right? I was thinking about this the other day, having spent a really gorgeous weekend with my lover and nothing was lacking and then I watched a romantic drama the following night and suddenly I began to have thoughts of I wish he would do this, I wish he would do that, he never does this and I noticed how I was getting into the romantic fantasy that our culture is full of all these fairy tales, all these Disney movies, all these Hollywood movies, all the books you read they're all premised upon this romantic notion of the perfect hero, you know, the love struck heroine and this beautiful romance. You know, he's perfect. He doesn't put a foot out of place. He doesn't have a hair out of place, you know, but this isn't real. Real people have flaws. Real people have shadows. Real people are not perfect and don't always behave perfectly and not everybody is going to have every single romantic quality that you're looking for. This is an ideal and it's dangerous because it destroys true relating. So the projection of your fantasy, your illusion onto someone else, creates a desire in them to pull away from you because they don't feel seen and heard for who they really are and they don't want to take on the pressure of fulfilling your fantasy for you. Similarly, seeing the potential rather than actual, you're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself, telling yourself a story. And again, this is originating in the part of you that is desperate for love and desperate for validation. It's not coming from the healthy, aligned, secure woman. It's coming from the wounded girl, the wounded child, the wounded teenager. It's not coming from the healthy self-sufficient, self-loving woman. I wonder if any of you recognize any of those patterns. Um, I'd love to hear. Feel free to share or ask any questions. Um, just looking at the video, I can't see any questions. Oh, I've seen three comments actually. Sorry, I didn't notice that earlier. Let's just see. Disney glasses. Ah, oh. hee hee hee, Jen, yeah. So, how do we heal? How do we heal? So for me, the recognition has been that this is an ongoing process. Again, anyone who tells you, in my opinion, that I've done the work and now I'm this, I don't believe them. Because in my experience and in my seeing, in myself and in others, there's always more healing that can transpire. There's always more wholeness we can become, there's always more integration that can happen. My experience is that I've been on a journey of repeated spirals, going up and down, in and out, integrating more, becoming more whole, but I still and always will have those tender parts of me that can become really raw and get really triggered. The, the main difference 
for me is that I'm more aware than I ever have been of what they are, how they feel and how to navigate them. And I no longer blame anyone else when I get triggered. I know this is my wound. It's my responsibility. I'm going to hold myself in this. It's nothing to do with that other person. And again, from my experience and perspective, as long as you continue to want to point the finger and make someone else responsible for your experience, you won't fully be able to heal and integrate those wounds and you will continue to keep attracting experiences that will push those same buttons again and again and again. But it's an ongoing journey. It's ongoing. And we just become more aware. We just become more honest we just become more self-loving and accepting of who we are in our fullness which of course includes our wounds and our shadows and seeing them not as something bad or to be ashamed of or denied but to just own because we're all the same we all have it so the healing comes uh, either in relationship or independently my pattern probably for me has been to be in a relationship or a lovership to get very triggered and activate um, activated or to experience abandonment betrayal rejection and then to separate and to go away and heal and integrate and do the inner work based upon that experience in my current relationship which we're navigating at the moment it might be ending it might not I don't honestly know at the moment what that situation is but let me just talk as if it's current for now um, this is probably the first time in my life that I've been in a relating where we are both conscious of our triggers we're both able to name them take responsibility for them do the inner work and come back together. So this is the first time I'm experiencing living that consciously in relationship. So the healing is happening live rather than have a relationship, get triggered, split up, go and do the work. But of course we can also preemptively be doing this healing for ourselves so that first and foremost, we're more of who we're here to be, not in order to get love because the whole point is you are love and the deeper you recognize that, that you are love and you embody that in truth. And of course the universe will know if it's not in truth, then the more likely you are to attract that. But you have to come at it from the perspective, not I'm doing this so I can go out and m m manifest or magnetize love from someone else to me. You have to do it solely for you. Because I want to love myself. I want to remember that I'm loved. I want to be whole. I don't want to feel this pain anymore. I want to be whole. I'm doing this for me. Not I'm doing this so I can go and get a man. Right? It's a very different energy and intention. Having said that, attraction is designed to make us whole. So whatever you do, you can't get it wrong. Because life is just going to bring you the lessons you need anyway, really. And of course I want to say also this is not necessarily applicable only to romantic and sexual relationship. It's applicable to any kind of relationship, you know. I get triggered primarily in romantic sexual relationships. Not much else really triggers me, to be fair. Kids never trigger me. Well, fairly, almost never. Kids almost never trigger me. Family doesn't trigger me. Friends don't trigger me. Clients don't trigger me place where I get triggered is in love and sex relationships. You might be different, but it's all out there for you. Pedal stools. <laughs> I like that. So the way to healing the path. And again, it's, I'm just going to talk super simply at this point, you know, um, I was intending to speak for an hour maximum. So it looks like we're on, we're on schedule for that. Awareness. Number one is awareness. We can't heal what we don't know is there to heal. So cultivating your awareness through education, meditation, is absolutely key. Awareness means you're able to say, this is mine, 
I'm able to witness what's going on in my body, in my mind. I can name it, I can identify it, I can see clearly what is going on. So long as you can't do those things, you're, you're operating unconsciously. You need to bring the unconscious conscious into awareness. So meditation and education are the primary tools for that self-awareness, right? That's where it starts. <clears throat> and if that's tricky, because it sometimes is for everybody, what can help you in that is, for example, noticing when you want to blame someone. Notice when you get triggered. These are your key, these are your, um, i trying to think of the right word. These are the arrows pointing you where to look. What triggers you? Write it down. Write down exactly what you feel and think about the other person. If it's not clear to you right now what your part in it is, write it down or speak it like, um, you know, Fred really triggered me. He was a selfish bastard because he took my sandwich out of the fridge and, you know, just write down what you think and then go back and read through it and underline, look at what you've said about him. And then take it all back to yourself. What is this showing me about me? So if I take Fred out of the picture, what is this showing me about me? Am I selfish? Am I this? So all the things you accuse Fred of, ask yourself, where am I this? Or where am I the opposite of this? If someone's being abusive, it doesn't necessarily mean you're abusive. It means you're codependent. It means you're allowing the abuse. It means you've lost your boundaries. It means you've given your power away. So that's how those two energies fit together, the key and the lock. So look for your part and stop talking about what's happening on the inside. Look to your part. Jenny, I'm just reading what you've said. Going back, when I'm hurt, I feel and hear an inner crying baby so loud that's hard to comfort. I first remember asking what this is on a bus home from school all those years ago. It's clear now. I've picked her up to comfort her at the age of 57. Yep. Um, I was working with a client um, the other day and a long-standing pattern of abuse in relationship. In guided meditation, and healing work together, we uncovered very quickly, this was about a three-year-old aspect that wasn't conscious until we brought it conscious. So the baby, yeah. Awareness, so awareness is key. This is mine, I can witness it, I can feel it, and I can witness it. I can identify it, I can name it, this is the the and I can see it very clearly. So that's the first part. The second part is, as I've kind of already mentioned, taking 100% responsibility. This is the kicker, you know, like when I was in abusive situation and in previous situations where I've been rejected, I've been abandoned multiple times, I blamed those men for my pain. Um, I would say things like, how could they do this? How could they do that? How could someone be so nasty? How could somebody be so lacking in compassion? Right? I would say that. How could someone be like that? I've given so much love. I've been there for them. What I couldn't see was that I was lacking compassion for myself. I was giving my power away. I wasn't loving myself. I wasn't saying no when they did things I didn't like. I kept quiet to stay in a relationship that was not serving my needs. That was my responsibility. They weren't doing anything to me that I wasn't allowing. I was an adult. I was a woman. So, taking 100% responsibility. It can be a bitter pill to swallow, but it's also the step to empowerment. Everything is my responsibility. Whatever is happening in my life, I am not a victim. 
even if something happens, that in that moment, of course, it can be, uh, you would describe it. So if somebody comes and smacks you, slaps you, hits you, stabs you, takes your money in that moment, yes, okay, you can describe it in the sense of, in that moment, you were the victim of an attack. Fair enough. And I'm not in any way, shape or form saying that you're deserving of that or that you attracted that because I think that's a misinterpretation of the law of attraction. But from that point forward, you do have a choice as to how you respond. And I do understand that the healing journey, if you've had an experience like that, is not instant. And I would not expect anyone to go from experiencing that kind of abuse or trauma to going directly from there the next day into the understanding that they're 100% responsible for their response and to shifting it around one, you know, 180 degrees on a dime like that. No, I don't expect that. There is an intermediate stage that needs to be moved through. Okay, that's important. Nothing should ever be bypassed. But then we come to the next point. The third point is feel it. So again, I see, and I've seen this in a lot of people, um, particularly in this male privileged society, that thinking is over privileged. Psychoanalysis, psychology, psychotherapy, the mind. Just staying at that level, you may understand, oh yes, I can name all my patterns, I'm this, I'm that, you know, you can have read Freud and Jung and you really get it all, you know, I've done all that too. However, it goes beyond that and you're never really going to heal fully and shift and shift your patterns of attraction and shift your frequency if you don't go into the body and feel everything fully won't cut it if you don't do that. You have to go to the wounds, you have to feel the pain, you have to feel it all, all the way through. That's where the ultimate healing integration happens, is in being present to sensation in the body. You do not need to add story to it, you do not need to add mental interpretation to it. A lot of I was going to say women, but actually probably people can get really caught up in the story. He did this and she did that and then this and then that and then this and then that and this and then that and this. Blah, 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 blah. Not going to solve anything. You know, it's boring, actually. At a certain point, it's just all up here. And it's an avoidance of feeling. It's an avoidance of healing. Stop the story. Get into the body. Feel what you feel. Name what you feel. I can sense my heart beating quickly. I can feel my solar plexus is contracted. I can feel this deep pain in the core of my heart center. My left eye is twitching. You know, whatever it is, feel the feeling, the sensation. Name that and witness it and be present to it. In that loving presence, presencing. It's a practice, presencing to yourself, to your emotions, to the emotion in the body. That's where the healing comes. That's where the, that's the root. That's when you get to the root of it. Everything up here, the story, it's not going to get to the root of it. When you go into the body and the sensation, you get to the root of it. You can root it. I'm not going to say out, actually, because it's just a healing. There'll always be a scar. But it gets to the root, the body, the feeling. This is where... Having someone to support you in that can be really, really helpful. Um, you know, I've been doing this practice for myself for years. It's still not always easy, necessarily. Emma says, deep pain of abandonment. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. I know that pain and it's really, really painful. For me, I feel it here right through the core of my heart center behind my sternum and it still gets activated and when it gets activated it's intense we all feel more or less i feel probably more intensely than most people so it's not enjoyable but it is sensation and it is energy and it will move a 
can shift and change and integrate if you allow yourself to feel it and not avoid it. Avoidance. So many people avoid overthinking, overtalking, overdoing, overeating, compulsive seeking of sex, compulsive seeking of relationship. It's all avoidance, compulsive anything to avoid feeling. The healing's in the feeling. That's it. No story. Yeah, just being present. So that's one of the it's one of the big parts of my holding when I guide people through private sessions is going into that in a really deep level with guided meditation, guided visualization, and sort of combination of all of that with energy healing and presencing, uh, and it's powerful. So then we come to the fourth point, and um, just feeling into your pain there for a moment that you just mentioned, Emma. You know, as I keep talking, if that's actually activated while you're watching right now as I'm talking, you can just put your hand on your heart, or both hands, and just breathe and be with the pain, and nothing else, just let the stories go, just feel it, just be with it, just hold yourself in it, breathe and feel, breathe and feel, breathe and feel, be with, be with, be with, be present to, this is the love, the presence you give to yourself in that moment is the love you didn't have, The so presence is love, this is also another recognition I've had, presence is love. Oh, my stomach's rumbling. Sorry, can you hear that? That was a really loud rumble. <laughs> Fourth point of the healing journey is forgiveness. So this can only happen when it's authentic. We do never forgive someone when we're not ready to. Inauthentic. We can never forgive to get has to come from the heart. So when we've been through all these stages of awareness, responsibility, feeling, we will eventually get to a point where we feel able to forgive because when you fully process the emotional part, you'll feel a release and you'll feel a letting go of whatever was there, anger, shame, blame, it will dissipate because you've held it and felt it and it's integrated, right? So then the charge behind it is released and from that point, you can come into the heart from an authentic, loving place and forgive yourself, first and foremost, for whatever went on, and everyone else. But only when it's, but only when it feels true. You might be able to forgive yourself initially. I'm sorry, please forgive me, I love you, thank you. I'm sorry, please forgive me, I love you, thank you. Keep saying that to that part of you. Forgive yourself, write yourself a letter of forgiveness. Let it be full. And if you can't fully forgive another yet, be okay with that. I forgive myself for not being able to forgive. My intention is to forgive, but it doesn't feel authentic right now. Maybe it will one day. I ask for the guidance that I am able to forgive because I know that until I forgive, I'm suffering. Until I forgive, I'm holding myself stuck because that's the truth. As long as you haven't forgiven, you're stuck, you're holding on to resentment, to blame, to suffering. You're making yourself suffer until you forgive, whether you need to forgive yourself or another. So that's part of this process of healing, letting go and forgiving fully and completely, authentically, when it is right. Knowing that everyone did their best, so eventually you're also able to see with compassion um, from a bird's eye view, and this is where the awareness, the witnessing consciousness also is helpful, they did their best. I see now. They couldn't have done differently given what they had. I had so gonna give you another example with my dad who was borderline narcissistic, borderline abusive, psychologically, once physically. Um hated him for a long time, had issues with men as a result of his behaviour to me as a as a teenager. But eventually I came to see that 
he was the man he was, is, was, was, because he's different now, uh, because of his childhood, he could see the experience of growing up in a very poor family during the Second World War, having holes in his shoes, not enough food to eat, a slightly abusive father, having the experience of trauma during the war, bombs falling around him as a 10 year old, right? Losing his best friend to an air raid. I could see how he was shaped by that and I could feel immense compassion. He couldn't do any different with what he had, given who he was. And everything's perfect. He was perfectly playing his role for me to be who I am. So compassion can come eventually, even for those that we hate or think are abusive. It can come. Um, the person I was with in an abusive relationship, I, I feel gratitude to him now. I feel gratitude. So this is all possible. And just to say that I have a completely different relationship with my father now. It's healed. It is healed. Um, let's just see, Emma has said, so painful. I've forgiven him, but no closure as he won't speak to me. I have to take it as a lesson, felt like the dark night of the soul, such deep wounding healing. Yeah. So Emma, you don't need to speak to him to get closure. It is and was a dark night at the soul. I know about those. The only thing you need to get closure is you. And the wounding and the healing is there to be healed as you are doing now and that's why he came. When the healing is fully complete, you will be more. You already are more. You're already more. And you're already becoming who you're here to be and he was part of that. So this is all perfect even as it's painful, but you don't need him for closure. That's just the anxious attachment part of you clinging on, still wanting something from the outside. Did I talk about anxious attachment? I don't know if I did at the beginning. I meant to. If I didn't, let me just quickly name that. Attachment styles come from how we were parented. There are two main styles anxious attachment where we think the caregiver is going to go away avoidant is where we've learned to survive to avoid intimacy and close contact so we turn away so usually guess what in a relationship one person's anxious so that means they're needy i need you i need you where are you where are you come back come back do you still love me and the other person's avoidant stop hassling me you're smothering me i feel overwhelmed leave me alone give me space right perfect match so anyway, coming back to the healing process, we've gone through awareness, 100% responsibility, feel it, forgive it. Five and six, the fifth point, find the gift. You're welcome. <laughs> I know what it's like and I know it's horrible, but I also know it's empowering eventually. So that's what I can say from an absolute truth. It's horrible, you go through it, you come out stronger, more loving, more heart opened, more who you're here to be. And that's the exciting part. And this is the fifth point is finding the gift. This is another part of the empowerment of the experience. Nothing is by chance. Everything is here to gift you. Everything is here to blossom you. And these most painful experiences are usually the ones actually that have the biggest gift. Biggest gift. That's how it works. So there will be a gift in the traumatic experience. There will be a gift in the painful, wounding experience. There will be gifts in there. When you've gone through the sequence of healing, you can then at a certain point feel ready to find those gifts for yourself. And there's even more empowerment that comes with that. So now I can turn to the one that I was in this abusive situation with and I can genuinely say that was the most intense dark night of the soul 
of my entire life. I thought I was possibly going to kill myself. I thought I was going mad. It felt like death in my body. However, I am so grateful to you for showing me that I did not love myself. I am so grateful to you that I was woken up to my codependence. I am so grateful to you for pushing my nose in the shit so hard and deep that I had no other choice but to take a deep breath and commit to loving myself. As a result, my life has only got better. As a result, I'm only a better woman. If I'd have stayed in that dynamic and not done that healing work, I would still be codependent, I would still be anxiously attached, I would still be needy, I would still be dependent upon external validation for my self-worth. You showed me so much about myself that I really needed to see. I am genuinely, sincerely grateful from my heart. Thank you so much. I send you on your way with blessings. I don't want to see you and hear from you now, but I send you on your way with blessings and I do have compassion for the pain and trauma you experienced that created you in the way that you, to be who you are. And I, and I pray for your release from any suffering that you feel, but that's not my responsibility, you know. The final point that um, I've added on, five is a good number, it's a magic number, but I had a sixth point that I added on here. And I know this is one that people said to me repeatedly um, that I didn't want to hear. And it's celibacy. I really didn't want to hear this. Because I love sex, I love physical intimacy, I love touch, I love it. And pretty much through um, most of my adult life I've been a serial monogamist. So there's usually been not that long periods where I've been single and not having some kind of sex with someone. After the abusive experience I knew, even though people had said this to me before, that I really had to become celibate. As part of my healing and giving my energy and my love fully back to myself until I felt ready to open in a, from a stronger place from a more whole place so I was fully celibate for two years I met someone and we were briefly lovers for a month um, I had sex once it wasn't right it re-triggered my wound another year being celibate so that's the longest time for me of celibacy but it was so necessary for me to not distract myself with anybody else and not putting my hopes on anybody else not relying on anyone else to feel whole to feel good to feel in love when I met my current lover I was feeling full in love, in my power, whole, no need, no seeking, no looking. That's how I felt. And as I said at the outset, we might be going our separate ways, I don't know. But right now, I feel the same. I feel in my power, in love, whole, Trusting, surrendered. Knowing that I can't hold on or cling to something out of fear. And this brings us to what I'll be talking about tomorrow, the embodiment of awakened love, which is moving from a place of love rather than from fear, which is its opposite. So yeah, that's my my sharing for today. Of course, there are so many practices and 
ways of supporting yourself in this healing journey. I can't possibly go into them all. Um, you know, it's my life's work, but I really hope that what I've shared here today has been helpful for you. Um, wasn't designed to be an actual ritual or process of forgiveness, but if that has happened for you anyway, then wonderful. Um, I'll be back tomorrow at the same time at midday to talk about embodying awakened love. And in the meantime, if you have questions that have come up for you, if you have something you want to share, then you can put it in the thread below this video and I will respond. And just also to say, if, if you feel called for support in your healing journey, this is really where I excel as a guide, as a healer, as a channel, you know. So if you're called to that, to working with me on a one-to-one -one basis, I have space right now for two people, then reach out. Um, I may be, I haven't decided yet, also offering a workshop around this so we can go into things as a group, a small group, more deeply to really do the healing live as a group, but I'm not sure yet, but I'm definitely available for one-to-one -one healing work, so reach out if that is you. I send you so much love. Also, yeah, just feeling guided to say, remember these are such intense times. So much stuff is coming up right now for all of us. It's really good to remember that and get that perspective uh, that the, the awakening and the healing energy that's coming through is so powerful. It's no surprise if your wounds are getting triggered and you're getting activated. So just be gentle with yourselves. And remember, we're all walking each other home, as I said in my one of my other posts. So loads of love, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Namaste.